Open Rotator Cuff Tendon Repair, a hybrid video that includes the classic knowledge with real case video. Kamal Goku's associates Professor Bas Kent University Alanya Research and Practice Center. Open Rotator Cuff Tendon Repair, a hybrid video that includes the classic knowledge with real case video. Kamal Goku's associates Professor Bas Kent University Alanya Research and Practice Center. Acknowledgement. This video was produced from the book source that was shown below. We would like to thank editors, Stephen H. Stern, Christopher M. Bono, and Matthew D. Saltzman. Citation. Key Techniques in Orthopedic Surgery, by Stephen H. Stern, Illustrated, Hardback, Team, Stuttgart, 2018. Abstract. While modern arthroscopic techniques for the repair of rotator cuff tears have increasingly replaced the need for an open approach, there are cases where it may be necessary. This chapter outlines the critical components of a safe and successful open procedure. It is most commonly chosen in settings of revision repair, massive 2 and 3 tendon tears, and situations where augmentation is considered. Postoperative protocols are typically dictated by repair size considerations rather than others associated with the approach. Operative technique approach. Semi-sitting or beach chair position. The patient is moved as close to the side of the table as possible while still being stable. Approach. 1. Position the patient on the operating room table as outlined earlier. 2. Prepare and drape the entire arm and shoulder girdle free. 3. Carefully outline prominent anatomic landmarks, coracoid process, clavicle, AC joint, acromion, and scapular spine. 4. Draw the planned skin incision with a marker. The incision should extend 2 inches from the lateral aspect of the anterior third of the acromion toward the lateral tip of the coracoid process acromion halfway between the anterolateral and posterolateral corners of the acromion. Place the skin incision in Langer's lines that parallel the lateral border of the acromion figure. Operative technique approach. Semi-sitting or beach chair position. The patient is moved as close to the side of the table as possible while still being stable. Approach. 1. Position the patient on the operating room table as outlined earlier. 2. Prepare and drape the entire arm and shoulder girdle free. 3. Carefully outline prominent anatomic landmarks, coracoid process, clavicle, AC joint, acromion, and scapular spine. 4. Draw the planned skin incision with a marker. The incision should extend 2 inches from the lateral aspect of the anterior third of the acromion toward the lateral tip of the coracoid process acromion halfway between the anterolateral and posterolateral corners of the acromion. Place the skin incision in Langer's lines that parallel the lateral border of the acromion. Figure. If an excision of the distal clavicle is indicated, move the incision approximately 1 cm medial to the standard incision. Figure. Infiltrate the skin and subcutaneous tissue with 1 to 200,000 concentration of eponephrine. Incise the skin and subcutaneous tissue down to the deltoid fascia. Develop the prefacial plane to expose the entire anterolateral corner of the acromion and the lateral aspect of the deltoid. If a chromioclavical joint excision is planned, dissect further medially to expose the distal 2 cm of the clavicle. Split the deltoid muscle in the raphe between the anterior and middle deltoid. Begin at the anterolateral corner and extend the dissection distally 2 to 3 cm. The direction of the split is approximately perpendicular to the skin incision. Consider placing a stay suture to avoid injuring the terminal branches of the axillary nerve. Figure. Starting from the split, release the deltoid subperiosteally along the anterior acromion using an electrocautery. Start several millimeters back from the anterior edge of the acromion. Figure A. Bovi electrocautery is more effective than sharp scalpel dissection for this step. Release the superficial and deep deltoid fascia. Tag these with heavy non-absorbable suture, which aids retraction and deltoid repair. 
carefully coagulate the acromial branch of the thoracoacromial artery that is usually encountered near the anterolateral acromion between the superficial and deep deltoid. Completely detach the coracoacromial ligament, usually along with the deep deltoid fascia, from its attachment on the acromion, figure B. It is not necessary to dissect these out separately. Extend the deltoid release past the AC joint. Expose the distal clavicle when distal clavicle excision is planned, figure A. Release bursal adhesions with a blunt instrument or an index finger. Acromioplasty. Protect the rotator cuff with a blunt retractor, such as a medium chandler. Perform an acromioplasty utilizing either a sagittal saw or a sharp osteotome, figure. The wedge of bone excised should be the full width of the acromion from the medial to lateral. A. The goal of the acromioplasty is to shape the acromion so its undersurface is flat from anterior to posterior and medial to lateral. After surgery, the acromion's undersurface should have a smooth contour for optimal subacromial contact. There should be no ridges or sharp spikes of bone, nor should there be anterior overhang of the acromion. B. The deep deltoid fascia attachment The deep deltoid fascia attachment to the lateral acromion can be used as a landmark to judge the amount of acromion resected. After an acromioplasty, the acromion should be flush with the deep deltoid attachment to the lateral acromion. Identify the subacromial bursa and perform a complete subdeltoid bursectomy. Rotating the arm internally and externally exposes the rotator cuff tendons. Assess the size of the rotator cuff tendon tear, the precise rotator cuff tendon anatomy, the shape of the tendon tear, the tendons involved, the degree of tendon retraction, the anterior and posterior extent of the tear, and the quality of the tendon available for repair. Tag the torn edges of the rotator cuff with heavy non-absorbable suture. Assess the need for mobilization of the tendon. Identify the subacromial bursa and perform a complete subdeltoid bursectomy. Rotating the arm internally and externally exposes the rotator cuff tendons. Assess the size of the rotator cuff tendon tear, the precise rotator cuff tendon anatomy, the shape of the tendon tear, the tendons involved, the degree of tendon retraction, the anterior and posterior extent of the tear and the quality of the tendon available for repair. Tag the torn edges of the rotator cuff with heavy non-absorbable suture. Assess the need for mobilization of the tendon. Several methods are useful in mobilizing the rotator cuff. A. Release and excision of the subacromial and subdeltoid bursa. B. Release of the coracohumeral ligament, which is a thick band of tissue between the coracoid process and the insertion of the supraspinatus tendon, Figure Longitudinal releasing incisions in the anterior tendon, in the rotator interval, or posterior tendon can help to advance. The supraspinatus, figure A, B. In large, chronic tears, consider the intraarticular release of the adhesions between the capsule and the rotator cuff, figure. After sharply releasing the capsule, use a blunt elevator to lift the muscle tendon tissue off the glenoid neck. Take care when dissecting the superior and posterior to plus avoid injuring the suprascapular nerve as it passes around the spinoglenoid notch. Minimally trim the torn tendon so fresh tendon is available for insertion to the bone. Once the tendon has been adequately mobilized, prepare an area of bone between the articular surface of the humeral head and the greater tuberosity to serve as the bed for the rotator cuff repair, figure A. Use wrong as curettes or a motorized burr to create a bleeding surface to optimize tendon healing. Take care not to create troughs or weaken the cortical bone. Longitudinal releasing incisions in the anterior tendon, in the rotator interval, or posterior tendon can help to advance. The supraspinatus, figure A, B. Enlarge, chronic tears, consider the intraarticular release of the adhesions between the capsule and the rotator cuff, figure. After sharply releasing the capsule, use a blunt elevator to lift the muscle tendon tissue off the glenoid neck. Take care when dissecting the superior and posterior to plus avoid injuring the suprascapular nerve as it passes around the spinoglenoid notch. Minimally trim the torn tendon so fresh tendon is available for insertion to the bone. Once the tendon has been adequately mobilized, 
Prepare an area of bone between the articular surface of the humeral head and the greater tuberosity to serve as the bed for the rotator cuff repair, figure A. Use wrongers, curettes, or a motorized burr to create a bleeding surface to optimize tendon healing. Take care not to create troughs or weaken the cortical bone. Inspect the biceps tendon. Occasionally if the biceps tendon is completely torn, it can be used to augment deficient and larger rotator cuff tears. If the biceps tendon is significantly degenerated, consider tenotomy or tenodesis of the tendon at the bicipital groove. After the preparation of the bed to receive the tendon has been completed, place soft tissue anchors in the humeral head approximately 1 cm apart in a staggered fashion, figure A. Pass non-absorbable sutures through the tendon in a similar pattern to its expected location of the tendon on the tuberosity bone. Tie the sutures with tension minimized by holding the arm in abduction, figure B. Alternatively, place sutures in the tendon and pass them through the bone tunnel from the tuberosity to the lateral cortex, figure AC. Once the repair is secure, gently range the shoulder through an arc of motion. Assess the integrity of the repair and the safe post-operative range of motion. If the rotator interval was opened for exposure, close it with absorbable sutures. In patients with a tear of the subscapularis tendon, replace the biceps tendon, if it is intact and in good condition, in the bicipital groove and stabilize it by securing the cuff on either side of it. Alternatively, the biceps tendon can be tenodized in the bicipital groove. See the video from the real case. Closure. Copiously irrigate the wound. Carefully secure deltoid to the anterior acromion. This is best achieved by making two 1.6 mm drill holes in the acromion, at least 5 mm back from the anterior edge, figure. Repair the deltoid to the acromion. Incorporate both the superficial and deep fascia in the repair using number 2 braided non-absorbable sutures, figure. Closure. Copiously irrigate the wound. Carefully secure deltoid to the anterior acromion. This is best achieved by making two 1.6 mm drill holes in the acromion, at least 5 mm back from the anterior edge, figure. Repair the deltoid to the acromion. Incorporate both the superficial and deep fascia in the repair using number 2 braided non-absorbable sutures, see the video. Thank you for watching this video. This video was produced from the book source that was shown below. We would like to thank editors, Stephen H. Stern, Christopher M. Bono, and Matthew D. Saltzman. Citation. Key Techniques in Orthopedic Surgery, by Stephen H. Stern, Illustrated, Hardback, Team, Stuttgart, 2018. Thank you for watching my video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel.